morning, Darby Vineyard. I am Catherine and I am a student here at Darby. Um, if you're joining us from Darby Vineyard Church, then welcome. Um, equally, if you are sitting here wondering why I'm appearing on your timeline today, um, or if you're someone who does not normally attend church, you are also super, super welcome. Um, if you are wondering what Darby Vineyard is about, then you can find out more by visiting darbyvineyard.com. Um, and let us know where you guys are um, tuning in from today. Um, we love to hear where people are coming from and viewing us. Um, and it's also really nice to hear from people um, since we cannot meet in person. Uh, just to give you a brief overview of what's going to happen today, um, after I finish talking, um, Charlie will be leading us in worship. And then after, basically immediately after, um, we will be getting a spoken word from Andrew, which is super exciting. Um, if you are someone who does not normally partake in worship, then don't worry. Just either listen or hum or have it on the background while you do some cleaning, whatever floats your boat. Um, and but if you do feel touched, then please go ahead to sing. Um, so I'm just going to very briefly lead us in some prayer before we start. Um, yeah, so God, thank you that um, we are able to meet you, albeit in our living rooms, in our um, bedrooms, and wherever we are watching today, even if it's on the train. Um, I just welcome your Holy Spirit. I welcome your presence into our rooms and into our lives, and that we are encouraged by um, Andrew's words today, and that your worship comes alive as well. Um, I pray for those who are watching um, who do not know you yet, and I just pray that you encounter um, those um, in this service this morning. And yeah, thank you for all that you provide for us. Amen. Thank 
want to see your kingdom here Spirit break out Break our walls down Spirit break out Yeah Heaven come down Hardly think as you call me 
Good morning, I'm Andrew. Thanks for joining us. We're going to continue with our series this morning looking at Paul's letter to the Ephesians. But before we get to the passage, I'd like to talk about one of my heroes. For many years, a guy called Mike Pilavacci ran a Christian festival for teenagers called Soul Survivor. I've only met Mike a couple of times, but he's a lovely guy, just the same in person as he is on the stage. Now the festivals have had a huge impact on me, not only when I went during my 20s and they helped, figure out, helped me figure out what to do with my life, but also on the lives of my daughters. The festivals finished a couple of years ago, but in the last year that they ran, they were attended by 32,500 people and over 2,000 people made commitments to follow Jesus. The impact that Mike and the festivals have had on the church in the UK cannot be underestimated. When I think of some of my other heroes, Mother Teresa, John Stott, who wrote the wonderful commentary on the book of Ephesians and inspired these talks, even the Apostle himself, who wrote, this, who wrote the letter, apart from their radical commitment to following Jesus and their willingness to take risks for him, they all have one thing in common. They were, and in Mike's case, still are, single. They would probably say that they wouldn't have been able to do the things that they have if they had been married and had families. In fact, one of the reasons Soul Survivor stopped holding festivals was that the guy lined up to take them on had a family. The Apostle Paul thought it was better not to marry as to say single like him. Now, I know many of you listening are married with kids, or that you would like to be married and have kids. But what I want to talk about this morning is being radically committed to following Jesus and the calling he has for you, regardless of whether you're single or married. Before we get to the passage, I just want to talk about the context that Paul was writing into. And the reason for that is that I want to demonstrate how radical Paul was, Paul was being. And I for these some of these ideas some of these thoughts i need to give credit for a guy called to a guy called andy smith from belfast vineyard in the ancient world paul was speaking into philosophers had done a lot of thinking and writing about the household and how it was to be organized thinkers like plato 
and Aristotle, maybe names that you've heard of, and many others took a great interest in it because for them the household was the smallest organisational unit of society. And if that didn't run well, society as a whole wouldn't run well, which was disastrous. Aristotle said this, Every household is part of a state, and these relationships are part of a household, and the excellence of the part must have regard to that of the whole. If society is made up of many households, then if the household runs well, the whole society will flourish. And in those days, they generalised household relationships into three categories, husbands and wives, fathers and children, masters and slaves, which matches exactly the three categories that Paul writes about in the passage we're going to look at. For Plato and Aristotle and the rest, it was a man's world and society was run in a top-down way. There was a hierarchy. The men were ranked higher than the women, children and slaves. To quote Aristotle again, there are by nature various classes of rulers and ruled. For the free rules the slave, the male the female and the man, the child in a different way and the man the child in a different way. So in the Roman Empire where Caesar ruled, everything was set up to maximise Caesar's power, privilege and control. The household functioned in a similar way. The men ruled and the whole thing was set up to maximise his comfort, his social standing and control over the household. And there are loads of writings about uh, advising women how to please their husbands, how husbands should rule their families and should deserve to do so. The closer you were to power, the more worth and value you had. Husbands could abuse their wives. It was expected that they would engage sexually with slaves, prostitutes, engage in pagan, rit pagan rituals. Female infanticide was rampant. Unwanted baby girls were left out to die of exposure. Unlike males, they didn't have any value and worth. That was the context Paul writes this passage into. Now, before I read the passage, I just want to mention that this passage in the past has been misused and has not been used and has been used to justify abuse, not in the way that Paul intended which was to give life and freedom. And because of that, I'm going to depart from my usual practice of using the necessary and I mean, new international version of the Bible and use the message, which is not so much a translation as a paraphrase, but it helps bring out the point I'm trying to make. Out of respect for Christ, be courteously relevant, be courteously reverent to one another. Those of you who read this passage in other translations will know that the word submit is used in this passage. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Be submissive to one another out of reverence for Christ. The word submission is a difficult one for us these days. In our culture we don't like to submit to anyone. We don't like to put others needs before our own. But you can see how in the culture that Paul was writing to, it was the very foundation of their society. Submit to Caesar. Wives submit to husbands. Children submit to fathers. Slaves submit to masters. The whole thing was hierarchical. So for, for Paul to say submit to one another was totally radical, totally countercultural. It would have been shocking to the hearers. To quote Dallas Willard in his book, uh, The Spirit of the Disciplines, the way of Jesus knows no submission outside the context of mutual submission of all to all. Actually, it would have been most shocking to the men who didn't submit to anyone and were used to doing whatever they liked. And the reason that it is so shocking is because it directly speaks to two issues, value and power, value and power. Paul is saying 
that because we are all in Christ, we all have equal value and worth, men and women, adults, children, slave and free. And that idea, which we take for granted now, wasn't anywhere in the thought and practice of Paul's day. To quote um, Timothy Gombis, who's a New Testament professor, Paul recognises the full dignity of everyone in the people of God. Each member is worthy of honour, and everyone fully and freely participates amongst God's renewed people. It is ordered under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. This is in radical contrast to alternative political visions in which communities had Caesar at their head. According to a Roman political system, a person's social rank determined his worth. If one is closer to Caesar, he has greater value. Such a vision fostered all sorts of mistreatment and injustice. Under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, however, no one has any greater value than anyone else. So by using those three little words to one another, Paul is blowing up the traditional understanding of power dynamics. And he's saying that power and leadership are for the benefit of the weaker members of society, for sacrificial service, not domination. To us, Paul's ideas might sound old-fashioned, but actually he would have been radically countercultural and light years ahead of his time. But he also isn't just fast-forwarding to our time, to 2021. He's proposing something altogether different. In light of Jesus and his church, a vision for marriage that is countercultural in his day of extreme patriarchy, but also in our day of extreme individualism, where our wants and authentic selves come first. None of us wants, wants to or likes to submit or even think about that, even to Jesus. Living a life today that follows and submits to Jesus and others in community is now countercultural and radical. So what Paul is proposing would have been shocking in his day and it's countercultural to us now. But the ultimate question it asks all of us is will we submit to Jesus? Paul then goes on to do something else that would have been shocking to us, his listeners. He addresses the wives before the husbands. Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. I use the message again, as the language is a little easier. So imagine you had to make a speech to an audience where the Queen was present. And for me, that is the stuff of nightmares, you know, having to do something like that. Or if you had to do a presentation to the managers and the company owner was present, you would address the owner first. You'd speak to the most important, important person first. In Paul's culture, there would have been no question that it was the men. And it would have been shocking that he, dress, he addresses the wives first. One of the reasons I wanted to use the message version is that the NRV uses the word submit again. But I wonder if this doesn't come across to us how Paul intended. I wonder if it is more of an invitation to wives rather than a command. So you see how radical he's been. He's addressing wives who had little value and power in their culture and he's putting them first not with a command, but with a request. He's giving them value that they didn't have in their culture. Husbands, go out in your love. Go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving, not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty 
Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her, dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. And that is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favour, since they've already, they're already one in marriage. No one abuses his own body, does he? No, he feeds and pampers it. That's how Christ treats us, the church, since we are part of his body. And this is why a man leaves father and mother and cherishes his wife. No longer two, they become one flesh. This is a huge mystery and I don't pretend to understand it at all. What is clearest to me is the way Christ treats the church. And this provides a good picture of how each husband is to treat his wife, loving himself in loving her, and how each wife is to honour her husband. So if you were to summarise Paul's instructions for how to make a marriage flourish, you would say that he invites the wife not to obey her husband, but to voluntarily submit to his leadership. And Paul doesn't invite, but he commands husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. So I just want to make a quick couple of points before I finish, and then I'm going to expand on these next week. Paul is quoting a passage in Genesis, and he's making two points as he does. The first is that you should love your wife as yourself, because she's literally part of you. Genesis talks about two becoming one flesh. If you're married or you've been married, you know that there's something really special when you're in step with your spouse, when you're in unity with them. But conversely, you know that when you wound your spouse, it's like you're wounded as well. And the second point is this, is the great mystery that he talks about, that the one flesh union of a husband and wife is a sign that points to the oneness and unity between Christ and his church. It's as though this was a mystery that was hidden in plain sight. This is a mystery that is now revealed, that marriage since Adam and Eve pointed all along to something that was coming, and Jesus' death and resurrection and the church gathered to him, it's now revealed. Marriage is many things, but it's a sign that witnesses to the world about the goodness and love and mercy of Jesus, and being joined with Jesus forever. So, I want to finish with a challenge. To live a life that follows the way of Jesus is to live a radically different life, a life that's countercultural. Jesus' teaching inspires people like Mike Pilevacci, John Stott, Mother Teresa. It goes to the heart of how we relate to each other, how we treat each other, what power is for. It speaks to the heart of marriage. And in view of that, when you look at your own life, how are you doing with being radical? So let's pray together. You might just want to quiet your hearts and just sit comfortably, maybe open your hands, close your eyes. And we'll just invite the presence of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, come and meet with us now, wherever we are, God, that you would meet with us now and we would sense your presence. Come Holy Spirit, we welcome you. And God, would you speak to us about being radical? In the same way that Paul was so radical with the Ephesians, would you speak to us about that? In the way that Mike Pallavacci has been radical all these years, God, would you speak to us and show us what you're calling us to do with our lives, with our days, with our time, with our money, our energy? Just come, Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? And God, I'm aware that there are single people who are, who are joining us. God, would you speak to them? Would you be close to them in their singleness, God? Would you um, give them patience where that's necessary? Give them calling where that's necessary? Just come, Holy Spirit. Would you meet with them? And God, for those of us that are married, God, would you, you bring in unity? Would you bring unity with our spouses? 
that we would be able to walk in step with them. And even as this past season has been so difficult, God, I pray that you would heal marriages. And where that's been difficult, you bring healing and you bring unity. And Lord, for those of us that are sick, maybe we're, <laughs> like me, recovering from COVID, um, God, would you heal us? Come, Holy Spirit, we speak to sick bodies. In Jesus' name, we speak to them. Command them to be well, energy to return. Taste and smell to return. Come, Holy Spirit. And Lord, where we're buried, where we've lost somebody, would you meet us in that, God? Would you come and comfort us? We open our hearts afresh to you again. Yes, Lord. Yes, God, bring your peace. In Jesus' name, Amen. So we, we hope you enjoyed the service. You know, let us know if you need any help, if you just want to chat and pray with someone. And we look forward to seeing you at one of the nine o'clock prayer meetings on Facebook or next Sunday. So let's just finish with the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. <laughs>